I'm leaving academia. I've, I've uh, had enough. I've, uh, yes, I've had enough. And this is me. I am a little bit of psychologist, 10 years online coder, and now an entrepreneur app maker. It's been an exceptionally hard decision. And a, a, there's a blog, you can have a look um, down there about it. So talk today is why, how is online research any good? And we won't have time for it, but if we do a little bit about what I see the future is going to look like. Why do we do online research? It's really quick. We can collect data, 60 participants in 15 minutes, and this was a few years ago. And if you can collect data that quickly, you can finish your study in stupidly quickly. Brilliant. It's also very, very cheap in comparison to regular research. You don't have to pay for uh, room hire RA fees. You don't have to do experiments serially, one at a time. You need to pay people fairly, though, which lots of people do not do. Your online participants are usually, uh, are usually a little bit less weird. I'm sure we all know about capital letter weird than those online. Be they a little bit weird in their own right, they're probably better at tech than the average population. So how can you do online research? Well, I've seen this a lot on Twitter and Facebook. You have people asking if you can do their study. I'm a member of a, of a, of a group where, where men doing psychological studies, because apparently it's hard to get men to do psychological studies on Facebook. But the problem there is we have psychologists who are weird. You're perhaps better off, though, collecting data through uh, panels such as Prolific and Amazon Mechanical Turk, where you have a far broader variety of people who are willing to take part for a small amount of money. If you want to do questionnaire-based research, there's a whole, there's several great, often free ways of collecting such data. If you want to do perceptual research, though, if you want to have things on screen for very short periods of time, for example, to record button presses, presses or to have video, you're probably better off investing time with some of these popular platforms. I've only ever used JS Psych, admittedly very, very infrequently, because I produced my own software called uh, Experiment, which I'm actually retiring because I'm going into app development, which I mentioned earlier. PsychoPy released a, a web-based version of itself. I don't know how that's going. I'm sure it's going well, though. <laughs> so if you want the most flexibility, you need to code your study yourself. And this has a number of issues. Is your study road tested? Is it battle tested? Is it secure? And you need to know a whole variety of different technologies in order to do this properly and to not end up with crazy fines from Amazon, which you'll hear about in two seconds. So Keller Bites at the bottom, awesome quotes, saying about how computing has a fantastic, uh, letting a computer lets me make far more mistakes than anything, anything possible, with the possible exception of tequila and an oven. I think it's a superb, um, su superb uh, quote. So what is road testing? Does your experiment, which you've coded entirely, perhaps in Chrome, does it work on all the other popular browsing platforms? I bet it doesn't. If you haven't tried, it won't. Does it work on all the past popular versions of these, of these platforms? No way it will work on all of those. And if you want to explore one way of getting around this, as I've put in the bottom corner, is that you can have a gradual rollout. You can do a, a study with maybe five people to start off with, 10 people, and you can use tools which actively look for errors in your browser and report to you live those errors. These, these are great. Sentry is open source. Rollbar is not open source. I use Rollbar because, I don't know, I, I quite like Rollbar anyway. It's worth looking into. So have you battle tested your, your hand-coded study I've fallen afoul of this. I used a small server on Amazon, and I ended up losing, a long time ago, I ended up losing a third of my data because the server just couldn't deal with all of this data coming in from these 70 people every 15 minutes. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're using big enough servers. You need to understand what's going on. So there's some bottlenecks, server, also, the database is a, is, a, is a bottleneck. I recommend actively monitoring, again, how, how these elements of your computer system are working 
whilst you're doing a study, you can use Datadog, which is a commercial. Amazon CloudWatch is another option. It's um, likewise give you real-time feedback about whether or not you're stressing your system too much. Load testing, I recommend Googling that. So there's, uh, there's services out there that will throw at your experiments or websites uh, a simulated 100 or 1,000 people every X seconds or X minutes. Great, you really should be looking into that. Serverless is a very, very popular thing. Do we have any uh, techies? Anybody, a coder in the audience? Um, yay, we've got one techie, excellent. Serverless is really popular. And uh, what it is is instead of having one big computer or, or several big computers that all of your participants come to to send their data and to get the experiment from, you have lots of little uh, programs which do exactly the same thing. You end up, though, shifting the bottleneck uh, from the from the uh, server to the to the database, which is um, you just kind of shift in the problem. It's databases are a lot better at having a lot of data thrown at them, but it's still an issue. I've actually uh, been playing with a, a solution to this, which I just open sourced. It's taken uh, my old platform, and I've just uh, stripped away a lot of the uh, silliness, and I've replaced it with a solution that doesn't need a database. So we're using serverless technology, lots and lots of little machines, and we're saving it directly into, uh, into what is essentially hard drives, but cloud-based hard drives. And it's, uh, it's anyway, if anybody's interested in uh, continuing this on with me in an open source fashion, please do get in contact. I'd be happy to freely contribute my time to that. Security is a big problem if you want to do your own stuff. When I open sourced this, I left in some Amazon credentials from like 10 years ago when I first started out doing online research. And I ended up with a $5,000 fine, which Amazon just paid back a couple of days ago after being on my credit card for about a month. And this is, I, I, uh, the technology has improved as to how you, you need to have credentials buried in your app. And it's just so, it's the case that I did this 10 years ago and the technology uh, didn't let me restrict permissions to the credentials that I used. But it's really, really, it's a really good lesson in that you need to be aware that silly things can happen. What happened was people got into my Amazon account and they bit mined, they Bitcoin mined using uh, like 100 odd massive servers for five hours. And they, and they managed to spend $5,000 worth of uh, of server costs and Amazon had paid it back because it was I was open sourcing some some work so I wasn't really being uh, malicious I guess. So uh, this is a really quick summary uh, benefits of going with experiment as a service. It, that is you go with a platform that does it all for you. They they save the data. They they run the experiments. They take away the risk from you in terms of de losing data because of bottlenecks hundreds of angry emails from participants who they've had to test their, uh, you know, uh, 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 my cat knows all about lots of angry emails from perhaps some of my old studies anyway. And uh, they, they take away some of this risk to you and they, they save you some headache. Some benefits of writing the study yourself, flexibility, reduced costs, benefits of using participant panels. You don't have to pay people individually when they come to your lab is a really, really great thing. And also you get to do, you have all the benefits of doing online research. Is online research any good? These are old papers and they did a whole range of different studies. To cut a long story short, all of these studies, they tried to replicate a whole variety of different old studies. The only study type that didn't replicate well was a mask priming task where you had to show things on the screen for a short period of time. And the reason for that probably was down to, well, was down to um, screen refresh. And we, we, we uh, heard about it earlier from, um, from Cauldron, in that if you show things for very short periods of time, you sometimes, if you show things for a short amount of time, for example, seven milliseconds, you've got a 10% likelihood of it not showing up at all. You've got like a 50% likelihood of it appearing for long, for uh, double the duration, and you've also got a 30% likelihood of it paying for uh, even, even longer. Um, so when you do a study online, uh, from a perceptual point of view, there's three things I, I would recommend considering. You have to consider the precision of the stimuli, the recording time of button presses, 
and the precise time of elements. Um, so precision of stimuli, you have different screen sizes. How do you know, if, if it's important for your study, how do you know that you have this given shape, the same size for all the, all the people? Likewise, color, different screens, different calibrations, lots of analog control and monitors. You have volume, how on earth do you know volume? You could use staircase procedure to establish minimum levels, of vibration. So in terms of, uh, you, you can actually use uh, your blind spot. You have two dots, one dot moving towards the other there. If you closed one eye, uh, you could find out when that second black dot disappeared and use that to change the size of your stimuli to try and approximately get equal sized uh, visual elements on, on screen for all of your participants. If you have a volume study requiring sound, you can have audi audible captures. You have the audible passwords. If you need to know what is the bare minimum sound, you can use the staircase procedure to find out uh, when people know, uh, when people can just hear things. We have uh, a clever chap in America who's we us tweeting with called Phil Corb Corbett. Yes, uh, he's he's trying to program up a quest uh, staircase which is a Bayesian staircase, really. And uh, g good luck to him. I mean, it's, it's going to be tricky because Quest requires lots of uh, data crunching. And, uh, but I could think he could do this by using, uh, in the web browser, you can throw away lots of, lots of uh, data crunching to um, what we call now, like separate instances of the web browser and it can occur in parallel. I don't recall the exact terminology, but I think that could be the way he could uh, approach that problem. At the end of the day, online research is great. Perhaps it's not quite as accurate as, on, as do, research done in the lab, but you can just collect more data, really. And the beauty of it is, why not do research in lab and online at the same time to get at your, your hypothesis from different points of view, perhaps? Uh, I, th I think this is quite a nice little thing. What happens if your participant is playing Angry Birds whilst you're doing the study? What happens if the study is done too quickly? These are only just some thoughts regarding checking for data control. I think it's probably wise to wind up the, the talk now. Um, there's a lot in those slides. Please go ahead and have a look at them.